What is this? This is yours, I think. <clears throat> Bring your shoe on the table. Oh, yeah. Um, if there is any, yeah, that would be great. Thank you. I think we're supposed to get started here, so we don't want to uh, disrespect those who came on time, uh, and that leaves us more time to interact after we've made a few comments. Um, are you ready to go? Okay. Yeah. So, um, oh, thank you. Oh, my. Appreciate it. I have a sore throat here. Um, I want to thank uh, all of you for showing up here tonight. I know you're all busy, and this takes you away from your, oh, thank you, for your daily routines, and uh, to give us some feedback on our report and talk more generally about uh, the settlement agreement and your views of how things are developing. We really do care deeply about the community's input and uh, their comments. I'm going to just make a few comments about the way our work is being structured, and then I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Christoph, who's going to actually summarize the report. Um, the structure that we've agreed on with the parties for 2018, we're hoping that Judge Simon doesn't have any issues with this, but is that there be four reports, like a quarterly report in 2018. And we just finished the first one, and that those reports would be topical. They would be focused on particular components of the settlement agreement. So the first one uh, focuses on mental health services and the mental health crisis response uh, part of the settlement agreement. And uh, that includes sections five and six. <coughs> and the, the argument behind this approach and why we've structured it this way is that uh, it gives uh, the parties, as well as the COCOL and the community, a chance to focus in on particular aspects of the agreement and not be spread out across all these things all the time and, and trying to bring closure to some of them. And we're hoping that 2018 is the year that we can bring closure to a lot of this. Uh, the settlement agreement requires that they, uh, the city, of course, remain in compliance for at least one full year after that. So we would still be around monitoring everybody in 2019. Um, but the, the way it's structured, so the first one that Tom's gonna talk about tonight is the mental health. Um, the second quarter, we will be, our report will focus on use of force, which is section three of the settlement agreement. Uh, the third quarter uh, will be, uh, uh, around, uh, that will be on training, which is section four. And the fourth quarter, uh, at the end of the year, uh, covers several areas. It'll be the Bureau's employee information system, which is designed to identify at-risk uh, officers and groups and help them get feedback on their behavior. And uh, officer accountability, uh, section eight. Um, which includes investigations, and then uh, Section 9, Community Engagement, which is why some of you are here, um, which uh, although our report on community engagement will not be until the end of the year, uh, we will continue to monitor progress in all these areas throughout the city uh, throughout 2018. Uh, and I think that's also the city is here tonight uh, after we uh, present. Uh, they will also, and we appreciate them sort of co-facilitating this town hall meeting, uh, they're on the agenda to uh, engage with the community as well. So, um, and, and I believe talk about the new arrangement uh, with the community uh, committee. Uh, so I'm going to introduce Tom, uh, Dr. Tom Kristoff, who will, uh, he's led our effort to evaluate the city and the Bureau's response to mental health crises, and uh, I want to ask him to give a, an overview of our first quarterly report uh, on that topic. So, Tom, you want to go ahead? Thank you. Um, so, our recently released uh, report, it looks at the implementation of the, the different paragraphs in the settlement agreement, as well as the systems of mental health response that have been created by that implementation. Um, 
As, as with all areas of the settlement agreement, we're evaluating the strength of the city's effort in implementing the agreement. Um, this will often indicate an organizational importance and priority. Um, and so from this evaluation of the city's efforts, um, this is where we draw conclusions uh, within, the, within the draft report. Um, in past evaluations of the settlement agreement, we had noted that the city was in substantial compliance with 20 of the 28 paragraphs. Um, since then, the city and PPB have made uh, the necessary changes in many of the eight remaining paragraphs. For this report, we found that the city to be in substantial compliance with 25 of the 28 paragraphs. And for those remaining three paragraphs, there were some issues which we found that prevented us from recommending unconditioned substantial compliance. However, also for these three paragraphs, um, the city and PPB had used mental health contact data to identify the same issues that we had identified. And the city and PPB had implemented remedies for these. Um, since these remedies are fairly new, their impact can't be fully evaluated at this point. Um, but the remedies seem methodologically and theoretically sound, um, and we believe that the path taken by the city and PPB will ultimately re resolve those issues in the near future. Um, so I'll, gi I'll give a summary of the, the different areas of the report, and then we'll open it up for public comment. Um, so with Section 5 of the agreement, it lays out some expectations for the city partners and the improvement of community-based mental health services. Um, however, only the city is legally bound by the agreement, and so we can only really assess the city's contribution and efforts in this area. Um, for Section 5, we believe that uh, PPB and the city have demonstrated a desire to work with community partners on improving mental health response. Um, PPB either oversees or participates on a number of subcommittees and work groups. For instance, the Behavioral Health Unit Advisory Committee, the BHUAC. Uh, this includes county, state, CCO, and service provider representatives. Uh, similarly, the Behavioral Health uh, Coordination Team, the BHCT, includes partners from county, CCO, service providers, and state and federal law enforcement. Um, a representative from the service coordination team, the SCT, uh, has been participating in the Oregon Behavioral Health Collaborative. Um, additionally, PPP, PPB had previously participated in the Health Share Subcommittee. Uh, and finally, PPB has also partnered with researchers at PSU to obtain input from mental health service delivery partners within the city. Um, PPB also continues to participate on the transportation work group related to the operation of the Unity Center, uh, as the expectation for opening the Unity Center is primarily f focused on the local CCOs. We looked at uh, PPB's efforts that fell within their span of control. Um, their efforts included revising their own policies to inform officers of their duties and, um, and also participating on that transportation work group. Uh, on, based on those elements, um, we, we, assess whether, we assess whether PPB and the city have done all that could reasonably expected of them. Um, we, we believe that they have. Um, while the operation of the Unity Center and the delivery of community-based mental health service overall can certainly be improved, the efforts of the city and PPB um, indicate to us that, it, that they have a high level of organizational importance and priority um, in, in this respect. Um, section six of the settlement agreement um, contains paragraphs that are more directly under the control of the city and PPB. Um, for instance, as, as we've noted in prior reports, the structure and the operation of the behavioral health unit, the BHU, um, has largely been in substantial compliance for some time. Um, BHU has also used data to coordinate with system partners, um, as well as inform organizational practices. One example of this is that PPB now regularly shares information and data with the Multnomah County Crisis Line. Um, this includes all individuals who are referred uh, through the BRS system, 
as well as incidents when uh, incidents where delayed engagement or disengagement is used. Uh, when receiving that, that information, MCCL can provide outreach and service linkage. Um, there are, you know, HIPAA and other legal restrictions somewhat prevent MCCL from uh, giving outcomes back to PPB in the city at the individual level. However, they are able in some cases to provide aggregated data back to, to the Bureau. Um, additionally, the Behavioral Health Coordination Team, um, as I said before, includes, a, includes representatives from a large number of city partners. Um, they too share information that is subject to lawful disclosure and they develop uh, coordinated plans in order to reduce future criminal justice interactions. Um, PBB has also used data to, on mental health context to inform organizational practices, most recently employing a strategy to make BERS referrals for persons who have had three or more uh, mental health templates within the preceding 30 days. Um, our evaluation of this data has shown that this is capturing people, a total of 151 individuals between June of 2017 and February of 2018. You can go. Yep. Um, as is noted in our report, the, the work of the Behavioral Health Unit Advisor Committee uh, continues to be substantially responsive to the requirements of the settlement agreement. Uh, the representatives are from city, county, and state agencies, local service providers, CCOs, and advocates. Um, we have personally observed a number of their meetings. We have seen them working well together. They've also provided recommendations uh, to, to the BHU, and in many cases, uh, the BHU has implemented those recommendations. Um, when not implementing it, they've always uh, given a written rationale. And some of those, those recommendations relate to training, um, the development of BHU, and the expansion of BHU. So for subsections B and C of section six, um, contain paragraphs related to PPB's immediate system of mental health response. Uh, this includes ECIT officers as well as uh, normal officers who have received the 40 hours of CIT training. Um, PPB's model requires all officers to have that initial 40 hours of crisis response training um, as well as annual in-service training. Um, these actions are consistent with, with paragraphs uh, 97 and 98. Additionally, officers who volunteer go through a selection process and receive an additional 40 hours of training uh, are considered as enhanced crisis intervention team officers. Um, this number of enhanced crisis intervention team officers has well surpassed uh, the initial goal of 60 to 80. Um, they now currently have 118 ECIT officers. Um, and one of the things that we had noted in past reports was uh, the expectation that PPB do an evaluation um, so that the number of officers is driven by the demand for services. This evaluation has happened in the re in recently, and so it now appears that the number is at least influenced by the demand for services. Um, our prior reports, we've, we've talked about the ECIT training. Um, in this report, we discussed the 10-hour refresher training for all ECIT officers, um, both for that initial ECIT training and the refresher training. Um, we feel that they comply um, with the requirement to specially train those ECIT officers. Uh, the initial training has included a number of topics, uh, including treatment and diagnosis, uh, crisis communication skills, resources, the ECIT response model, um, the refresher training, which we, which we recently observed, uh, covered topics such as juveniles in crisis, uh, individuals with autism, and system and organizational <coughs> updates related to ECIT operations. Um, you know, based on our observation of all the trainings, um, we feel that it's consistent with the expectations of the settlement agreement. 
Um, there are two paragraphs related to ECIT that, uh, for which the city and PPB have not reached full substantial compliance with. Uh, the first is paragraph 99. Um, this paragraph requires uh, the establishment of a mental health model crisis intervention team. Portland has its own model that um, we've agreed to to evaluate the effectiveness of. Um, as I'll, I'll note later, we've that that evaluation occurred. Um, one key area of difference between the Portland model and the Memphis model is the types of mental health calls which trigger a specialized response. Uh, in the Portland model, ECIT officers are dispatched to a subset of crisis calls that involve criteria which are considered to be indicative of higher acuity or greater risk of harm to the subject or others. Um, the evaluation of the, of the model came, looked at, uh, looked at a number of things. One of them was capacity. Um, so the evaluation showed that calls with a mental health component make up approximately 8% of all, call, all PPB calls for service. Um, additionally, within the five month time frame, there were about 1,000 calls that met that ECIT criteria. Uh, with these, uh, this this comes out to being about 6.29 calls per day, and I'll, I'll go through some of the differences and outcomes that we found uh, for our report. But given the uh, capacity issue, uh, we believe that the number of ECIT calls, uh, which officers are currently dispatched to, uh, should be expanded, um, as 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 the evaluation revealed that the specialized response may be underutilized. Um, for outcomes, uh, the evaluation uh, looked at a total of three outcomes. Um, one of them was force. Uh, however, there are only 22 cases, um, 22 force events within the data set, and this uh, this did not allow for conclusions to be to be drawn from a statistical standpoint. Um, the next evaluation with a, was arrest. Um, between ECIT and non-ECIT officers, um, there was no difference in, in the rate of arrest. Um, however, there was a difference in transports to the hospital with ECIT officers significantly more likely to uh, transport the subject to a hospital compared with non-ECIT officers. And I should have noted that uh, these calls, or the, the data that was evaluated were for non-ECIT calls. Um, based on the differences in outcomes and based on the capacity for the expanded dispatch criteria, we've recommended that the city revise its ECIT uh, criteria to have ECIT officers uh, directly dispatched to a higher proportion of mental health crises calls. Um, we have laid out the conditions um, within our report for what full substantial compliance looks like. Um, we believe that this can likely be accomplished. Um, wait, I think we did you go forward again? It's the conditions. There you go. Oh, yeah. The other one. That That's one. it. Um, sorry. Um, so we, we, we laid out the conditions within our report um, to, revise the, to revise the criteria for which ECIT officers would be dispatched to, to, pour, to perform an updated evaluation of the data um, to revise policies and to uh, put forth training for BOE call takers and dispatchers. Um, and should, should all of these be met, we believe that PPB and the city would be substantially complying with paragraph 99. Can, let me, can I just clarify mm -hmm. that a little bit? So we have given the city, as you've seen in our report, substantial compliance with the condition that these are met. Uh, so it's not like it's a partial compliance at this point. Uh, it's, but with these conditions we felt need to be met or the rating might be changed in the future. Um, another paragraph uh, was paragraph 105, which uh, relates to the mental health template. Um, as we've noted in our report, the form itself to collect the data on mental health contacts appears sufficient uh, to accomplish the goal. Um, 
However, there has been some concerns with reliability in the past. Uh, when we identified those issues, PPB had already taken affirmative steps to improve the reliability of the data. And this was through roll call presentations, discussions with sh uh, shift supervisors, and training reminders. PPB has also uh, presented a methodology, uh, a quality assurance methodology um, related to mental health templates as well as other data collection efforts um, within mental health response. As, as the data issues still, still remain as of today, we can't recommend unconditioned substantial compliance. However, <coughs> we, we do credit PPB and the city for taking the steps to resolve the data issues. Um, and we, we believe that the proposed methodologies will ultimately lead them to be found in substantial compliance. <coughs> Next one, I apologize. And the last one is uh, paragraph 115. Um, we, we've concluded that the city's work is, is nearly complete. It's necessarily contingent upon the implementation of the revised uh, dispatch criteria and the ensuing outcome data. Um, we reviewed a, a sample of calls and we, we found that BOEX uh, had been dispatching in accordance with prior with prior criteria. However, since the criteria is going to be revised, um, they, we need to have that implemented and in place uh, to ensure that crisis triage is fully operational. Um, we also evaluated the behavioral health response team, the BHRT, and the service coordination team, the SCT, um, both in terms of their adherence to the respective paragraphs in the settlement agreement, as well as outcome data associated between these, um, with these two teams. Um, for instance, BHRT, um, they, they meet the requirements of the settlement agreement in that they're comprised of one PPB officer, one qualified mental health professional. Um, BHRT is also the full-time assi full assignment of each of the officers. Um, after seeking and incorporating the, the input of BHUAC, PPB has identified the training for BHRT officers, selection criteria, as well as retention criteria. Um, policies have been enacted uh, regarding the transfer <coughs> of the transfer of individuals to the Unity Center via AMR ambulance service. Um, and so we, we feel that overall the steps um, for BHRT have substantially complied with those, um, with their requirements in the settlement agreement. Our evaluation of BHRT, uh, the outcome data and the, the data associated with it also supports this position. Um, ECIT officers and non-ECIT officers appear capable of making recommendations through the BRRRR system. Um, for those who are referred to BHRT, approximately half are accepted for BHRT assignment. Um, for those who do not get accepted, we, we found that 40% were already receiving or engaged in services elsewhere. Um, for those of for those who are accepted for BHRT intervention, 34% um, receive service coordination. 21% of the cases, the BHRT's concerns were mitigated after the initial contact. Um, we also looked at uh, longer term outcomes associated with BHRT. Uh, what we had found was for arrests and custodies, um, BHRT uh, participation was associated with a mean decrease of 0.67 arrest custodies in the year after BHRT intervention compared with the prior year. Um, other factors might be at play in there, but overall the findings are suggestive of a positive impact. Um, Similar to BHRT, we evaluated the service coordination team. Here again, we found that uh, the operation substantially complied with paragraph 112 of the settlement agreement. Um, we, we evaluated the data of service coordination team and found a 24.1% completion rate. We had noted in prior reports, 20% completion rate. Uh, so this is consistent. Um, 
we also you know reemphasize that a 20 to 25 percent completion rate for service coordination team we believe is a is a respectable completion rate given the population served by service coordination team um, for both those who completed uh, SCT and those who did not complete there was a decrease in the overall number of arrest custodies uh, in the year after compared with the year prior. Um, also for those who completed the service coordination team, there was an increase in employment um, as well as improvements in housing situation. The findings that we present in our report are, are reflective of findings that have also been found during uh, in PSU capstone study classes. So taking all of the elements that I, I feel like I very quickly just covered, um, taking all of them together, we believe that there's been a commendable effort on the part of the city and PPB to comply um, with those requirements um, pertaining to the overall system of mental health response. Uh, we believe a lot of the necessary elements have been input, have been put in place. We do identify those three key paragraphs where PPB and the city have not yet reached substantial compliance, um, and we've laid out specific conditions for reaching those goals. Um, throughout the next year, we will continue to monitor whether those conditions have been met before making any final determination. We have made a final determination. We just had before giving unconditional substantial compliance. Yes. Um, so. I think one thing that we would like to do is open up the discussion um, for any questions or comments on our draft report. After all, that's why we're all here. Um, I think they're going to facilitate this discussion. No? Okay. I will, I will pass the mic around. Okay. Okay. And I, we, just, we're ha I want to just say one yeah. thing. I wanted to acknowledge that uh, the Department of Justice folks are here today, uh, both from Washington. I see Laura here. and. Uh, and in the back, Jonas and um, and the chief, uh, and then also uh, the, the locally, the U.S. Uh, Attorney's Office. Uh, where is Jared? Is he still here? Sure. Oh, up here. Hi. Uh, so uh, they're here as well. If you know, not that you know, not that I want direct questions at them, but it, uh, we've tried to work in coordination with them, to because uh, they are officially the monitor for the settlement agreement. Yeah, okay, go ahead. Go for, ahead. for comments and questions that get opened up, I also want to say what we have historically done and what <coughs> we'll continue to do um, is to uh, document each of those comments and questions, put them into a spreadsheet, and, and provide a response to them all. Before, before we start the public comment mm. process, I just want to s remind us, we didn't announce this at the beginning, I apologize. We are live streaming this meeting and we are also broadcasting it on channel 30. So um, speaking into the mic helps people at home here. So um, I will hand it over to you, Julie. You are raising your hand. Will it be, will it be captioned? Yes. I just had a couple of questions about some of your stats. So you said mm -hmm. of the, the members that were accepted into the louder. Okay. Of the members that were accepted, 34% went to service coordination and 21% concerns were mitigated. So that's 55%. What happened to the other 45%? Um, others, so 10% was systems coordination, 8% refused assistance, 16% um, unable to locate, 9% was uh, the jail or the criminal justice system. Okay. And then 50% um, are accepted, 40% already were involved in services, and the other 10%? Uh, for the people who were not accepted, uh, so half of, yes, about 50% are accepted. When only looking at the people who were not accepted, 40% were already received or engaged in services. From the program? No. Other These are, yeah, from other programs. Um, so we've got the two groups accepted, not accepted. If we're only looking at those not accepted, 40% of those people. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Joe? Mm 
on a April 7th, Saturday, we had a man who I probably wouldn't hang around with or be friends with, brutally killed with eight shots to the body, who was going through, obviously, a mental breakdown. So we've spent millions of dollars. We've had you for a few years. We've had the co-op give you 100 recommendations. And the only success that I can think of is in 2010, Keith Notice was shot 22 times. This guy was only shot eight. That's our success. You can do all the data you want. Explain that to me, how eight cops went in and butchered this guy. Explain that, please. Thank you. Well, thank you, Joe. Um, we, we're not going to be able to explain that because um, two, two comments. One is, uh, first of all, it is a tragedy. I don't know the circumstances. And the reality is that until there is an investigation of all the details and the videos have been looked at and they've interviewed all the people who are there, uh, I think it's it, it, we, we never comment on on those kind of cases until we know more about it. But I, down the road, we're certainly happy to look into that. Uh, the other part is that, as you know from our work uh, as social scientists, we, I look at the whole organization, I look at patterns and trends across over time, across individuals, individ uh, groups of officers, all the officers. I, I, I don't like to draw conclusions anyway, even if it was a bad incident about one incident. It has to be a pattern of incidents. And you're saying maybe there is, but so we're not going to, I can't get into that right now because I don't know. We don't have enough to comment on intelligently. Doesn't that give you a pause that all of your work and all of the money that we spend on tr retraining the police officers exposing them to what it means to have a mental breakdown and then have this happen just on the facts that we know that are on the video that people have testified to just those yeah. does it have, i yeah. mean when i heard it yeah. after crying for a long long time i said what are we doing Should I shoot this guy because I don't like him? Because I don't, I, I disagree with him? He's acting crazy? Do I have the right to assassinate him? That's what they did. They assassinated that guy. And it's not over. If they can do it to him, they can do it to you. They can do it to me. That's what we fight about. In our different ways, we're all frightened. I hear you. Thank you, Joe. Uh, hi, Dan Handelman with Portland Cop Watch. Uh, we've been working on our comments for the fairness hearing that's happening tomorrow, <coughs> which I don't think got mentioned yet, at Judge Simon's courtroom um, at 9 a.m. And uh, so some of these, will, you'll, some of you who go there tomorrow will hear again. Uh, but uh, just to respond to what's already been said, you know, you mentioned you only look at trends. The trend is that since the DOJ came to town, almost everybody who's been shot by the police has had a mental health problem. That's a trend that flies in the face of the settlement agreement. So I think it's time to stop making excuses about I don't have all the facts and look at the trend. You're supposed to be doing that. Um, the uh, question about the Unity Center, we have friends in the mental health community who came to this last forum that was in this room and said the Unity Center doesn't work for them or people in their community. Uh, Portland police refused to take their guns off when they go in there, and the Portland police shot and killed the person inside a mental hospital in 2001 and caused a lot of controversy in the community by doing that. Um, so the fact that they're in substantial compliance with this um, unity center is, I don't think that jibes with the, what the community would say. And I think what this all brings to mind, my comments so far, is that the loss of having a community body helping to guide your work has disconnected your work with what the community is thinking. And that's why we had a COAB, and then the city just assembled it last year, and they are trying to do these, this replacement. Um, but we need to have people advising you so that you're not putting things in substantial compliance when they're not. 
And so on that, on that note, you said that these three paragraphs have things that the police haven't done yet, and yet you found them in substantial compliance, which is not how you've been rating them previously. It kind of feels like people are trying to hustle to the end line here because they're sick and tired of dealing with it, and they just want to check the little boxes and say we're done. We want this to be done right. I mean, we don't think it goes far enough. We've said that from day one. But you can't just say we're in compliance when there's stuff that's still not done. Uh, so, and that, which leads me to a question. I know you wanted questions. And my question is, <laughs> when the substantial compliance is rated for being uh, solid for a year, is that based on the first time you said that paragraph is in compliance, or is that once the whole settlement agreement's in compliance? Actually, I'm going to turn that question over to the Justice Department because I don't know if Jonas uh, or Laura, do you want or Jared, uh, in terms of is it com a year for each paragraph? Because they don't always come all in compliance at the same time, and I don't know that the uh, that you guys have ruled on that. As of right now, without any further interpretation, it'd be for the entire agreement. So it would be. They all have to be. In compliance, and then it's from that day forward. Okay, I'm going to get Philip and then you, okay? Thank you. Philip, you had your hand. Thank you, Dan. <laughs> Hello, I'm Philip J. Wolf. I would like to make a comment uh, and it, that leads into a question. <clears throat> Several months ago, I had repeatedly asked what is happening with the 100 recommendations that the COAB compiled that have been sitting collecting dust. They have been sitting by the wayside for three years. And I can't stress enough this point that the COAB was a team of volunteers who did an enormous amount of work, volunteered their time, gave their energy, sat down to discuss and review these recommendations to provide input, and provided over 100 different recommendations. And only one of those has been seen to completion, but the remainder of them have been sitting obsolete. And my question, and what I'd like to say tonight, is there are several stakeholders who have worked with the COCAL team to make, the, make other recommendations, and those have been adopted. Why can't the same respect be given to the community when we have worked really hard on those over 100 recommendations? So I would like to know what the status of those recommendations is. There was an article, I believe, uh, Nicole Miller, was the author and said that 50, there were 50 recommendations, and so I actually clarified that article that there was over 100. So I feel that we're be treated, being treated as second-class citizens and referred to as people who are not on the upper level of everyone on the city. And that's just our perspective, and that's our concern. And the concern is that we really worked personally to improve our community, but that's what is happening is not community engagement. And related to John, John L. Fritz, uh, he was murdered two weeks ago. And they, this was an all-day chase. The, the, clearly, he was having in a mental health crisis, but was being chased by officers. And then we had officers show up with a sheriff. And I had really didn't understand what the sheriff's role was in that interaction. And they brought the dogs out who were barking and chasing this individual who was clearly in crisis. And I don't understand how this is helpful. I didn't see any ECIT officers there. Uh, they just went directly in and started firing. So seeing that broke my heart. And that really helped me to realize that this is failing. So I just want to say his name so that we are able to remember that because a life was taken at the hands of officers. And I do want people to keep in mind that after all this data collection and research is finished, if there is no accountability, we have a problem, Ser a serious problem. Uh, okay. Ted made a comment last week on Monday saying that we need to hire 100 more officers. Sorry, excuse me, it was 93 officers. I'm confused a little bit about the specificity of the 93 officers, but that, alone will cost $10 million and will increase 911 calls. We're going to, of course, need more officers if people continually call 911. But I have a question. 
the increase in 911 calls, why does that require more officers when actually the number of cri criminal, uh, criminal calls has decreased? So that's something I would like to know about. Okay. Thank you, Philip. A um, couple uh, comments. First, the 100 recommendations from the COAB. Um, uh, we were there for a lot of that, as you know, and, and worked with people closely. Um, I, to my knowledge, all those recommendations were forwarded from the COCO to the city and to DOJ. Uh, I can't speak to all of them, but I can say that a number of them were, in fact, incorporated into the discussions that occurred with the city's policy group and the and DOJ and when they sought revisions to uh, 1010 force policies and other related policies. So they were incorporated and they were used. Uh, so that that's important to know. Um, in terms of this second question about um, uh, calls for service and needing more officers, um, you know, I've looked at a lot of police departments around the country, and some of them do claim they need a lot more officers and they're really busy, and I don't see it that way. But for Portland, I think it's a little more serious. Portland does, relative to the number of officers they have, they get quite a few calls. And so um, I think, you know, I, I'd have to look at it more carefully, but I do think that. Um, <clears throat> and I, in contrary, I think to what you said, Philip, my recollection is that crime is going up in Portland. And we know that the population is growing rapidly. We know the number of calls for service is growing pretty rapidly. And uh, so all those factors, I think Portland the City Council should take a look at that. And, and the other part of it is I've spent much of my career <clears throat> pushing for community-oriented policing and community policing. And uh, as I said before the President Obama's task force a couple years ago, uh, on 21st century policing, that we need police that are engaged with the community, get out of their cars, walk the beat, uh, interact with the community. Uh, I'm always disappointed that in Portland and every city that I've worked that only like 5% of the people know a police officer by name. That shouldn't be. Uh, and But when I always propose those things, the pushback I get usually is that our cops are too busy responding to calls. And getting out of your car takes time. So. Community policing might be a little more expensive. So I'm, I think, I'm not saying it's not necessary, but I think that Portland is in a position to look a little more carefully at it, so. <clears throat> well, and I, can I just friendly uh, point something out? That after the Trump election, after that specific election day, there were a number of protests that occurred. There was really high tensions uh, for that political environment, and, Officers showed up in riot gear. Uh, that consumed a lot of resources and continued uh, to uh, have more oppression. They and they were they were documenting um, and taking pictures, and there was no investigation done there. So it was really targeting and oppressive for peaceful protesters who wanted a voice. And that cost that situation cost the police eleven million dollars. Over, over that time. So I'm curious, if we don't do any investigation and we don't do any data collection on those incidents, how can we ensure that they are being improved? Because the city did spend $11, mil spend $11 million on that, and now they want more money for more officers. So all of that in combination is quite expensive. Well, I don't, know. I, I, I don't think it's fair, Philip, to say there has been no investigation. I know the Bureau has done some of that. I have not studied them all. I know that the independent police review uh, that's part of the inspector of the auditor's office is has received complaints and uh, and and various uh, torts and stuff and they are uh, investigating these matters so they're in the process of doing it right now I have looked at some of those cases and so I think I don't think it's fair to say nothing's being done I just don't know the outcomes are going to be what they're going to be at this point <clears throat> Just to clarify, I mean, I'm not saying, I'm disagreeing with your statement that there's no investigation happening. I'm saying there are no results, just so that we're clear. Sure.
Lightning. Lightning and then Joe. Make sure there's anyone else who wanted to talk. Okay. Uh, yes, my name is Lightning. I represent Lightning Super Cre Creativity Independent Watchdog. Just my own opinion, I think you've done effective and efficient work. And it's made very interesting discussion from my point just as a audience member. So I will commend you on your efforts. Now, I do like the fact of the Unity Center being open, the Randall Group funding that. Uh, and I like the fact that there's some other private parties out there, possibly even Homer Williams, looking at doing these type of centers uh, using private capital. So uh, I think that's very positive and moving in a very positive direction. Uh, one of the things that I have a problem with is using the term uh, community policing. Okay. Uh, when I deal or think about people with mental health issues, I don't want people with weapons dealing with them. So when I use the term policing, if they're carrying weapons, I have a concern, number one, from the get-go. Here's my position. Uh, the mayor wants to hire additional officers. ONI's budget is $10 million. We have 95 different uh, neighborhood associations in different locations already being funded $10 million. I would like them to come up with ways to implement community neighborhood safety type methods for the people with mental illness and people in their communities. Because I think what we're missing something here when we say community policing is that when they're carrying a weapon, and they see a knife, mm -hmm. and they see a gun, somebody's going to get shot very fast. And every time, if you watch, it tends to happen that way. We need to separate that and have trained individuals in the neighborhoods that are paid. And we can create a nonprofit that can end up, the city can pay that nonprofit, that $10 million. But what I'm saying is that... <coughs> From the city's position, they need to make a choice now to either fund 93 officers and use the ONI money to do it and abolish ONI, or have ONI come back with an idea how they can work within the neighborhoods that they're already receiving $10 million and implement ways to protect the people who have mental health crisis and, uh, and not be armed when they do it and come up with ways that we do not have to shoot someone uh -huh. that has a knife in their hand and they refuse to drop it. Do, that we do not have to shoot somebody that has a gun on their side but they don't have their hand on it. And we need to be very cautious on trying to separate the police and the mental health intervention and have community members or neighborhood members that are being paid to do this mm -hmm. and separate that because the police are trained to use their weapons. The police are trained to respond if they see a knife and somebody walks two steps forward. I can assure you, if you look at that video at City Team, when he took two steps forward, he was shot. And we need to try to prevent that <clears throat> from happening. We need to stop that from happening. And that's what the video shows. So again, this community policing, I think that term mm -hmm. needs to really be looked at close and understand. I think there needs to be a separation there Yeah. and really separate it. Yeah. Well, thank you, Lightning. I hear what you're saying. I also think your proposal is the kind of thing that I would hope the new community engagement committee could deal with because they, they're meant to deal with stuff like that, I think, and tell the mayor what they think about, uh, more so than us even. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> when you first came to town <clears throat> and held your first meeting, <clears throat> the COAB meeting had 200 people. They were lined up on both sides because the community was interested in what you were doing. And we knew it had, it had to change. The second meeting, you had maybe 50 people. Third meeting, you had advocates and activists. That's who you had at all of the rest of the meetings. 
Does that give you pause to say, what the hell happened? We had this wonderful thing going on our first meeting, and by the second meeting, we screwed it up. Do you ever say that to yourself? Well, I don't want to relive what happened. Uh, I, we, we all learned a lot from that. Uh, we, I had, I thought, the most distinguished people helping to, to facilitate that in Portland uh, with uh, the judge uh, from the Supreme Court and from community leaders. And, um, but there was a, the, there, there's been a lot of analysis since then by the city and by people in the community that have given advice to the city about how it can be done better. And uh, I'm hoping this time around, uh, it'll go better. I, I just- uh, hire on your job. That's their Well, no, they, I mean, I'm talking about uh, f the city is, do you want to address, does anyone want to address the facilitation of that process or? Yeah. Mandy, do you want to just allude to what's going on so people know? Uh, maybe they didn't see the mayor's announcement or whatever, but. Yes, um, and in fact, we're going to announce this at the end of the meeting of the Cocal Town Hall, and we can continue to talk about uh, community oversight uh, during the community discussion. Um, but right now, we are, uh, two things have, are, well, one thing happened and one thing's about to happen. So on Friday, um, the city will release the application to sit on the Portland Committee for Community Engaged Policing. Um, and we will start to do community outreach. Um, and we are, uh, we'll be holding some standalone sessions that we host across town throughout the community uh, to give people more information about the process and to let you know more about what um, the board will be doing. Um, and we're also um, happy to come if you uh, volunteer or are part of a community or an organization and you'd like us to come and speak with you as well. And our intention for community outreach for this board because of the history of community oversight and how things went with the COAB, I'm very clear that the work for us when we start to talk to people about this application and this new committee is that we also uh, are going out and doing a lot of listening and that we, we know that in order to um, talk about this new application, we also need to give a lot of space for people to express whatever it is that they want to express. Um, about fears, concerns, frustrations. Um, part of the work of our outreach is also to start building relationships and really listening to our community members. And our intention is to try to uh, encourage and support people who are not normally, people who don't normally feel welcome participating in this process. Uh, and so one thing that has recently happened that I'm very happy about is that we have also, um, our evaluation committee of community stakeholders has chosen um, facilitators to support the board in their work. Um, and I am very excited and proud that we have selected uh, the firm Training for Transformation and Brad Taylor Group. I think that these two firms together um, are a really special combination and they bring, they are subject matter experts in the sense that they have academic, professional, and lived experience, both with mental health and uh, with be being part of groups who are traditionally discriminated against. Um, they have a lot of wisdom to bring. Um, I know that this isn't a magical solution and it doesn't make everything better, but I do see a lot of hope and potential. Um, and my intention for this board and our facilitators' intention is that we do everything we can so that this board can be empowered to shape itself, uh, to determine how its work looks, and uh, that they get to decide and take the lead on how to engage with community and how to support the police in engaging with community. So um, our facilitators will start uh, work hopefully by the end of this month and hopefully you will get to meet them in the relatively near future. Um, I wanna let you know, we will be uh, promoting or sending out information on the application on our uh, the settlement agreement mailing list serve. So if you're in the room tonight and you would like to get that information, just uh, mark on the sign-in sheet that you'd like to be on our mailing list and that way you can receive information about the application process. Um, and also, if you just wanna talk further, you want more information about the application or if you would like us to come uh, to your community or organization to talk more, um, grab a business card of mine, I am happy to talk with anyone more about the process. Yeah, and Joe, I, I just want to add, I'm sure it'll make you happy to know that we'll have nothing to do with it. <laughs> so, 
please do not take what I say as criticism no, of I'm, your organization, because I'm not. Yeah. I'm not criticizing. It was here before you got here. Okay. And we, you tried to fix it. Yeah. Only time will tell if what your recommendations are will help fix it. Okay. We have no faith in it. We have no faith in the Department of Justice. We have no faith in the city. Why? Because a mentally health guy got blown away. Our faith went right out the window, and I don't even know the guy. But it was so crushing because it's the core of what you're working on. The core, and the, and the city has constantly closed the door to all the activists, not the advocates. Advocates are nice. Activists are not. We throw rocks. We tell you you're full of shit. That's what we tell you. We're not interested in making friends. Advocates are. And we're right. We're standing here and saying, you butchered somebody May 7th. I mean, April 7th. The anniversary of, of Keaton Otis is eight years. It's coming out next month. We've been on a vigil, all of us, for years. I knew his father. Breaks my heart when I go. So I had to stop going for a while. And then, um, and nobody mentions it. We got data. We got data. And we're doing wonderful things. I'm so proud of what we're doing. Guys laying on the ground with eight shots in him. And one of the cops is the same cop that was involved with King Notice. Come on. If you were a mechanic, this car would never get out of the garage. Thank you, Joe. Um, I think if there's no more questions, we're done with our, oh, one more from uh, Dan. Hi, thanks, yeah, Dan Handelman again, Portland Cop Watch. I mean, this, some of my comments are sort of a transition over to the next thing, but there seems to be a lot of assumptions that the judge is going to accept all the recommendations tomorrow, even though the community is gonna be coming in and saying what, what the community thinks about these proposals. Uh, and there are things, you missed the, um, the city's forum last month when there was a discussion about the BHU Advisory Council and there was a per person in the audience that wasn't part of Cop Watch <laughs> who was very, very incensed when she found out those meetings were closed to the public. And this is, we've been saying this to you since they started meeting, uh, which is before you were hired, that since they started meeting behind closed doors and you're satisfied with the fact that they voted and said, we don't wanna have our meetings open to the public. <coughs> it's just causing frustration. And now we have PCCEP is allowed by the way the agreement's being amended to have a meeting every month that's not open to the public. It's just gonna generate a lot more of this discontent and uh, suspicion that th something's going on behind closed doors. Uh, and um, so uh, I also wanna say something else that you missed at last month's meeting and, and reference your data on the service coordination team, which last month, I, maybe I used poor wording, but what I was trying to say is that what happens with the service coordination team is that person gets arrested over and over and over again, and then the police say, okay, here's the deal. Either we're gonna take you to jail or you're gonna go to rehab. So it's kind of like a Sophie's Choice or a, um, I can't even remember the other metaphor, but uh, it's, not, it's not, they don't really have a third choice um, of not dealing with the police at that point. There are lots of people who want to get help from rehab facilities and uh, other kinds of agencies that don't get it. So as a social scientist, when you're comparing the people who complete the program and people who don't complete the program, which you didn't mention, by the way, the people who do complete the program have a lot fewer arrests than the people who don't complete the program, right, afterward. Yeah. Um, but you should be comparing them to people who try to go into rehab on their own without the police and see if there's the same outcomes. Like if, they, if, if those people also end up without having as many arrests after they voluntarily go through a printing, then the police don't have to be involved. And that's what our objection has been all along, that we're <coughs> turning the police into the social service agents and this program is coercive. I said compulsory last month, I meant coercive. 
Um, so I, I just wanted to make that comment. Okay. Thank you. Hi, I'm Stephen Entwistle. I uh, do a lot of volunteer work, uh, and uh, I uh, used to be a bouncer, and I had to deal with a lot of drunk people and uh, a lot of behavior problems and people that were, you know, high on different things and such. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> I never had to have a weapon, okay? Um, but what I did is I used <clears throat> what I figured would be a psychology to get uh, the person, uh, you know, in a different state of mind. I've worked security all my life. Um, I'll tell you a real quick story of uh, a guy that was up on the third floor of the 500 building. I used to work Lloyd Corporation. And uh, I got a call from the boss saying, go up, we've got a, we've got a crazy guy up there. He thinks he owns the building. Okay, so I go up there and I talk to the guy, you know, and he, <clears throat> as I get up there, I see him on the side and he sees me and I'm in my uniform and all that. And all of a sudden he just kind of cringes up like he, he's expecting, to, you know, for me to react a certain way. I went up to him and I go, <clears throat> how you doing, sir? And he goes, oh, I'm, you know, he just kind of muffled, you know, and I go, are you hungry? You want to have lunch? I go, we're on the third floor. You know, they smell the cooking. He goes, oh, uh, no, I got I to gotta leave. I got to leave. You know, so it's just, if you change the entire situation, and, and, and again, I work at a church right now. We feed uh, two to three, four hundred people uh, every Wednesday, hmm. and homeless and, and, and so forth, the low-income folks. <laughs> I've had to stop a few fights, uh, getting between them, you know, before they, uh, you know, get in problem. But like I say, I never had to use a weapon. I never had to hit anybody. Um, <clears throat> I've been hit a couple times, but I didn't react to it, and I stopped it. We de-escalated the situation before it escalates. It's a de-escalation that we need to start uh, really focusing on, okay, instead of the, the profit margin, you know, of having a nice house and having an education for your children, for the police officers and, and improved housing and all that, you know, we don't want to turn Portland into a, into a complete, uh, I mean, what do we want, a military base as Portland? No. Come on. I, I grew up in the, uh, you know, uh, up in, you know, in the parks uh, in the 70s. You know, where, where, where every, you know, it's so different now. We don't have freedom. The children don't have freedom now, but they, we used to. You know, we used to be out in the parks and there'd be people everywhere, just young guys, and you know. But there was a group that was larger than just the individuals in that specific age. Okay, there was like from from like 20 on down. Uh -huh. And what they did is they taught us something. There was a one word that they taught us, and that was maintain. Okay, and if you didn't maintain, you got booted out of the group, you got the worst punishment you could ever imagine, okay, <coughs> which was getting pushed out, of the, you know, pushed out of the group. Nowadays, they're all the same age. There's no education there for young folks that want to express some freedom. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Steve, and I totally uh, appreciate your comments, and uh, Tomorrow, uh, with Judge Simon, I'm going to be talking about de-escalation more, and I think that yeah, you're right on target there with that. Well, if there's no more, we'll thank you very much. And Tom, you want to mention about the feedback? Um, I just wanted to make sure that everybody knew. Um, I know that when we had sent out our reports, we had we had also included this is where you can send comments. Um, Amy. Do you, do you remember the mailing address that it can be sent to? I don't know it off the top of my head. It is on the website, portlandcocal.com, though. Portlandcocal.com. So okay. they can send in, can't they, electronically? They can send to Rosenbaum and Associates at gmail.com, um, and you can go on uh, portlandcocal.com and it'll be there on portlandcocal.com yes. our, our web email address too so please if you have any comments big or small you know something you don't like on page 35 just tell us because we are very responsive I know Dan knows this we've uh, spent years responding to his lengthy comments <laughs> <laughs> and we agree with a lot of them we don't agree with all of them yeah we, we, we try not to say hostile things Cocal, okay, but it's not spelled out on the website. Uh, Portland C O C L. Oh, Portland C O C L. C O C. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. 
Okay, I know that's one of your big points you always make. Uh, Portland Cocal, C O C L dot com. Is that right, Amy? Okay, Mandy, thank you. Thank you guys very much for your comments. Are you going to I just have a burning question for okay. you. Do you feel satisfied with the de-escalation training being 40 hours, or do you think that there should be more intensive training? Because I have t taken training down at DPSST, and their de-escalation tactics, I've had a chance to observe those as a role player, and there are a number of different scenarios. And so I'm... I'm just trying to imagine how police feel because during that training, they knew it was a mock scenario. They're playing around. They know it, you know, they know it's not real. But in the real world, it's a different story. No one's watching. No one's there to supervise them. So I'm just thinking about the mindset between those two experiences. And I don't know if it's more training, if it's more in depth. But I'm just curious if you're satisfied with that 40-hour training. Well, first of all, it's not. There's no 40-hour de-escalation training uh, in Portland yet. I mean. There's 40 hours of CIT training, which does include some of that because it's about how to identify uh, mental health symptoms and, and how to respond appropriately. So it does include some of that in keeping, uh, creating time and, 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 and uh, staying calm and all that. Uh, there is a new de-escalation training that's coming. Uh, the new chief has, uh, is planning to bring in the Police Executive Research Forum in Washington. And that they're going to train the trainers, if you will. They're going to train the instructors at the Portland Police Bureau Training Academy uh, in about a, in the next in May, and uh, we'll see how that goes. I, I have some respect for the Perf people and what they do, and uh, and I think the Training Academy now is ready and open to that. And some of that will then be incorporated into the in-service training that will occur. Uh, in later in May and June and, and that sort of thing. So, uh, but there's a lot that we could go on and on. We don't have time right now, but it, I'm a big fan of not just academic heads talking, talking heads on PowerPoints, but but practicing and rehearsing and and getting one on one and being videotaped and and getting a real feel. That's uh, good to know. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> So we will take uh, just a, a 10 minute stretch break, use the restroom, um, and then we will come back and, and talk and have a community discussion together. So yeah. Thank you. Thank you.
I really do appreciate your time. This is a quite the busy week. We have the status conference and fairness hearing, as Mr. Handelman mentioned, tomorrow from 9 to 5 in the federal courthouse um, in, I don't know, Judge Simon's quarters um, or his courtroom. In any event, um, I would like to introduce Judith Mowry, who is going to facilitate the community discussion. I think we've had you know, ample discussion um, kind of during the COCLs, the COCLs presentation. And so we are looking forward to kind of engaging you all further. Um, Judith, take it away. Thank you, okay. And um, I'll just sit for this one second. I did want to do a check-in though, because looking around the room, I know a lot of you are going to be spending tomorrow in court, that that's where your interest is. So I wanted to be sure people felt like spending the next half hour together was what they would like to do. Do people want to stay for another half an hour? I just want to be respectful for uh, Dan. Was that yay? I can go home or no? I want to stay. <laughs> okay. 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 So uh, so let's do that then. Um, and Mandy, are you gonna? Um, be Oprah? I guess uh, Oprah was never actually out there with that microphone. I don't know what I'm thinking. Yeah, what? <laughs> so, uh, I'll do okay. that. Oh, so Mandy's cell phone is somewhere in this room. Um, if you all could look around you, I don't know what it looks like, but it's a. So everyone on the live stream can hear this. It's a black. <laughs> it's a black Apple Six. Oh, 503. It's on vibrate though. Yeah. Oh yeah. No. Um, anyway, it has no case on it. <laughs> yes. If you see it tonight, it's probably mine. And, and on that note, we'll move into an actual conversation that doesn't involve my phone. And if you guys don't mind my sitting, I'm just recovering from having been ill, so it's just um, uh, easier for me not to top tip over. Um, um, so, um, Dan, I, I was going to say that you said that you feel like you have questions that were still... Um, have not been addressed. So would you like to start with one? Well, uh, I don't know if it's exactly a question, but it, it relates back to uh, Mr. Elephant's death. I'm sure the city, oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. This relates back to Mr. Elephant's death, and I know the city doesn't want to comment on it, but uh, it's a more general uh, comment and observation about the entire way we've set up our crisis intervention team and enhanced crisis intervention team here in the city, which is essentially that once there's a weapon, that's it. Crisis intervention is off the table. And I don't think that is appropriate. I think the whole point of having crisis intervention is that even when there's a weapon, they've got to figure out a way to, just like this gentleman was saying, this guy, they've got to figure out a way how to de-escalate the situation. So you don't have to comment on the Ella Fritz case to uh, respond to that. I'd like to hear more about why we just throw the crisis intervention training out the window once there's a weapon. Yeah, I saw some looks, confused looks. Who would like to answer that? Um, You're familiar, Dennis, or is that the case, to your knowledge? I don't think I am. I think it's more a policy. Jonas, I hate to bother you with this, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, he just starts eating. Or, or if the city wants to respond, yeah. Thank you for the opportunity to talk about it. However, we are here to listen tonight and uh, hear from the community. I don't think we're here tonight prepared to answer the community's questions about specific points of compliance. Our compliance report was filed with the court in December, and that report speaks to itself, speaks for itself with respect to the compliance ratings on any individual paragraph of the agreement. Okay, and it looks like Tracy has something to add. The only thing I would say is that um, if if you just look at the directives, I don't think that that's an accurate statement of police bureau policy because Directive 85020 specifically identifies presence of a weapon uh, and a mental health crisis as a criterion for ECIT dispatch. So that's the only thing I wanted to say. Last week, Thursday, uh, at the county meeting, uh, the uh, county attorney uh, was there, Mr. Underhill. And uh, 
I trapped him, and we started a conversation about the problem that we're having with activists being arrested. Here's what's happening most of the time. An activist will do something that really irritates somebody, and they get arrested. Now, we expect that. However, when we go through the first step, which is at the Justice Center, and we plea, the charges are dropped over and over and over. It's happened to me at least five times. So my question to the DA was, can we sit down and figure out a way that we don't cross the lines or we don't irritate mm. the politician to the point where they just call for an arrest? Or the politicians get instructions from you guys, don't do that. Don't arrest these guys. De-escalate it, figure it out. Because being arrested, I don't know how many people in this room have ever been arrested. It is scary. And I've been doing it for 40 years. Scared the hell. When they put handcuffs on you, totally helpless. You can't do anything. We got to figure out a way. The, a lot of the activists really care about what's going on outside themselves. <coughs> and sometimes they screw up. They make a mistake. And they get arrested. And if you arrest them, damn it, take them to trial. That's what we, our system is supposed to be, not to harass them by using the arrest. So that's... Does anybody else here on the city, and that's what I'm really interested in, have anything to contribute to that? Because Underhill looked at me and he, he said, all right, let's do it. Let's work on it. You get a couple of your activists together. I'll get a couple of my people together. And we'll sit down and we'll talk. How hard is that? Is that against the rules somehow? <laughs> that we sit down and we talk to each other and just say, I don't want to go to jail. And they say, I don't want you harassing this guy over here. Mm -hmm. So that's it. Anybody got any ideas on that? So I don't have any like immediate ideas, um, but I certainly am willing to kind of take your suggestion back to Mayor Wheeler. And if we can sit down with DA Underhill and brainstorm like rules or I don't know, like whatever you have in mind, whatever uh, you know, your colleagues have in mind as to, you know, okay, well, this is the line. We can go up to that line safely and no harm will you know, come of the activists. Like I think that's certainly a conversation that the city can have. A lot of, of course, oh, absolutely, I mean, yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah. And so I think, yeah, I'll bring it back and we can move forward. Okay, he's waiting for me to, uh, to contact him. So uh, if you and I get together, maybe we can coordinate the, yeah. the county and the city. No, absolutely. Um, okay. Nicole, N I C O L E dot grant. I'm, I am around find the city, me. city a lot. All right, fair enough. So I'll find you in, I'll <laughs> find you in council chambers. <laughs> Thank you. Other, yes, lightning. Um, and uh, Dan and Lightning both raised their hands. Oh, sorry, also, I didn't. And I also want to make sure, just if people haven't <laughs> spoken in the room, I want to make sure we've got space. So definitely, if you haven't spoken up yet, let me know. But so Dan and Lightning, and I don't know who went first. I was waiting for everybody else. Fair reading. enough. Yeah. There you go. There you go. Uh, yes, my name is Lightning. Again, uh, I'm going to just bring something up that, you know, when I was watching that shooting at City Team, and I saw that individual refusing to drop the knife, and, and they uh, asked him numerous times to do that. One of the things, and I, and, I, and I hate to say this, is that I understand they used rubber bullets or bean bags, and then also uh, I don't believe they ended up doing any type of the stun gun or anything like that, but my only question is that with the technology that we have today, when you have an individual 20 feet away from you with a knife, are there not other types of weapons that we should also be looking at? And, and the reason why I say that, and I don't mean to sound outlandish here, but 
when somebody is, is killed, I, I like to look at any possibilities, is that even if we could use a, a certain type of a, 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 a dark type gun that they use to literally make them pass out and shoot from a distance. And, and why I'm saying that, some people might hear that and go, that is just completely unreasonable to even go in that direction. But the reality is, is that he was shot eight times and killed. And there's got to be other alternatives of weapons that we can use. And when I'm talking that, I'm talking tranquilizer type gun that would literally make them pass out. And, and have we ever looked at that in a, in a, in a more uh, direction that we think some of those weapons might be used? Because all we hear is we see the standard weapons they have. And we saw what happened when a knife was, he had a knife in the hand. Was there anything else we could have done, any other type of weapon used, that could have changed that situation? And that's all I'm asking, because we have such, the technology has advanced so much now, I am really surprised they don't have certain type of weapons that if someone has a knife at 20 <coughs> feet, that they can use something different that might be able to make that person at least drop to the ground and not kill them. That's all I'm saying. Non-lethal weapon. Thank you. Thanks, Lightning. I think it's going to Dan. So uh, a lot of the discussion, I think, tomorrow is going to be around the aspirations of settlement agreement and what we're actually, I guess, for lack of a better term, settling for. Um, what is fair, adequate, and reasonable? Does adequate mean, well, eh, it's good enough. Where's adequate mean this is going to fix the problem? That's what I think adequate should mean. But if it just means, eh, good enough, I don't know about these amendments, and I don't know about the, you know, the, we've had complaints about the agreement from the beginning. But one of the things in the, in the agreement has to do with who gets to be in the training division, or ECIT, or BHRT, for that matter. And it says that if an officer has been found guilty of uh, excessive force within three years, I think it is, then they can't be in the training division. Well, officers in Portland hardly ever get found guilty of use of force. Um, they, uh, the, they get cleared almost all the time by internal affairs investigations, especially not in deadly force cases. So we are now losing the training division commander because he's become a new deputy chief. And the lieutenant who's in there now is Lieutenant Leo Besner, which we call the million dollar man because of how much money, that's a low count of how much money he's cost the city and the number of lawsuits he's been involved in for violence, including shooting Raymond Gorder in the back with a sniper rifle while Raymond Gorder was on the phone with a hostage negotiator. Uh, but that happened in 2005, so it wasn't three years ago. But the community remembers. And he has continued to have violent incidents throughout the years, including within the last year. And he's now second in command in our training division. Can the city please promise us that he's not going to be promoted to be the new captain there? I don't think any of them are. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> On behalf of the mayor's office, like we cannot make that promise. Like that is absolutely a decision by Chief Outlaw, um, and I can certainly take your remarks back to her. Um, but that's just not. I just don't have the power to do that. Philip? I never need the mic. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to give it to you. That's one nice thing about being deaf. I don't even have to deal with it. It's all weird, and people get weird around mics. We'll get so um, just a follow-up comment uh, to Lightning. Uh, I think your ideas are great. I really do. I don't see why we can't explore some of those. But I think, really, the point of it is that that situation that occurred, there was no de-escalation tactics. There was no approaches to engage in de-escalation. And I think de-escalation is number one. Shooting should be the absolute last option. And I think that's what happened, because the situation escalated very quickly. And that's what occurred. As far as other technology and other weapons approaches, I am concerned about you know, adding tranquilizers or darts because it still motivates officers to actually use weapons when instead we need to be encouraging officers to 
really shift their approach. They need to be shifting how they think about things. They need to be involved in de-escalation tactics, asking people how they're doing, talking to them, engaging with the person, because I think if we give them more technology, they're gonna rely on that more, and the situation's just gonna continue to escalate. So I do have some concerns about that, but I think your heart is definitely in the right place, and I see that, but I just personally have some um, concerns about that. Thank you. Others? I know Dan's waiting. If there's no one else, Dan will go next. <laughs> oh, Dr. Rosenbaum is making snarky remarks behind me. <laughs> um, so uh, kind of building off the last comment I was making uh, about, uh, well, this was about the, um, the training. Uh, the um, uh, the de-escalation that we've been talking about, uh, that everybody's promoting, uh, we have said for quite a while that the settlement agreement uses the term de-escalation in two different ways. One of them is to mean when you approach a situation, again, like this gentleman was talking about before, and you say, would you like a sandwich, which de-escalates the situation. You don't use force at all. Um, the other way that the settlement agreement uses it is when somebody is using uh, a taser and then they go and use pepper spray, which is a lower level of force, the police think that that's a form of de-escalation. The DOJ uh, calls it, a, you know, I can't remember the terms, I haven't written down here somewhere, but they call them both de-escalation. And I would really, I mean, we've been suggesting that one, the second one should be called mitigation of force. Hmm. Because the force has already been used. You, you, know, you haven't de-escalated the situation, you've already used violence. So at that point, you're just mitigating the force and making it less force. So is there a way that we can, you know, start using terminology where de-escalation means that there's no violence instead of you're using less violence? I don't know. I mean, I'm sure that DOJ doesn't want to answer it, so <laughs> I'm not sure if Dr. Rosenbaum has an opinion. I have a lot of opinions. <laughs> <laughs> Dan, I've been saying this since the day we arrived here, so I am, I'm in agreement with you. The terminology, there's been a broader definition of de-escalation used here in Portland, and I think the Bureau is coming around to see that the standard in the field now is more narrow. Uh, and um, so it's a matter of, uh, I do genuinely believe that the training that you're going to see done here in the next couple of months by outsiders will help to change that. And I think that, um, you know, uh, the whole idea of this stuff is really, t I mean, yes, there is still a de-escalation role involved when force has started, but long before that we've tried to give as much attention as humanly possible to all the precipitating factors that lead up to the necessity of using force. When police use force, oftentimes it is justified at that moment. The question is, how did you get there? And was it necessary to get there? Um, and uh, who, I mean, sometimes there's no choice, right? The person is just attacking you and, you know, whatever. You have to use some level of force. But there are many situations, we believe, that, that do escalate. Uh, and I think that, uh, and there's a lot of factors that go into uh, keeping it uh, more calm and taking your time. So the, the new training is really about buying time, staying calm, talking to people, let, letting them talk more than you're talking, uh, and all that stuff. I could go on on respecting them. Uh, and police, though, have been trained historically to gain control of the situation immediately. They're trained to, and they oftentimes are trained to use a commanding voice and, uh, and, 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 and kind of in a threatening way to say, if you don't stop what you're doing, this is going to happen to you. And uh, rather than ask, uh, would you like a sandwich? And so that's a mindset that needs to change, in my view. I happen to agree with you. It doesn't happen overnight, and, uh, and no one's saying police should put themselves at risk and, and, and uh, unnecessary risk. Uh, but anyway, I don't know. I'm just starting to answer your question. But 
So just I, I found the terms that were used by the DOJ, which is event de-escalation, which is what we mean by de-escalation, and force de-escalation, which is what we're calling mitigation of force. So just for the record. Duh, he flagged me first. Right. You're next. No, he doesn't need the mic again. I keep, I don't, I, it's like I've never done this with When will it stick? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to train you. You need a cookie? <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. I'm teasing. You're sweet. Um, <laughs> so last year after COAB, uh, no, that was two years ago. That's right. Um, last year, I was hired on as a role player over at DPSST, Department of Public Standardization Training, for six months. That contract was a state contract, and my role was a role player working with trainers in different scenarios, people being arrested, pulled over, drug use, mental health situations, just a variety of scenarios. It was an incredible experience. And this was the first time that I really recognized the root of the problem. And I encourage everyone to be open to a different perspective. And I'm not here to attack anyone personally, but instead point out the problem. First of all, all of the trainers were white males. The police officers had this old school mentality, very, you know, very machismo. Uh, that thought had pervaded the rest of the officers. They had their um, their rings on, their class rings, their identifiers to show their uh, allegiance. And this behavior is learned by the new officers in training. So they adopt those similar attitudes as they go into their work. And that's a concern. And I remember one day I was working with one of the trainers and I asked what their position on uh, Black Lives Matter compared to um, police involvement and uh, the issues with that. And his response was, black people deserve it. It's their problem. And that comment stuck with me. That was from a trainer. And I tried to explain to them, offer a different perspective, and I couldn't get through. I did inform the supervisor of my concerns about this one person and their toxic mentality, and that comment was ignored. So I'm just trying to understand how that could happen in the first place. And I did my own research, my own analysis. Um, this may be some graphic information, but it dates black to slavery, and when um, black people were up for um, had their own communities, they had their own businesses, um, white people would come in and destroy them, they would vandalize, they would terrorize people, murder them, lynch them, and going on until Lincoln, he was the one who f first came up with the idea of abolishing slavery on a political platform. And um, the men who were in power who were murdering black people ended up in positions of being police officers. So this history has continued. That oppression, the system of oppression has continued from that time. It hasn't changed. And I have had the privilege of meeting some good officers being able to ex express my concerns, getting to know them personally. I have had a few experiences with that. I know that there are good people, but overall it's a toxic system until that's changed fundamentally. And with Kokel's work, doing their presentation and their data research, I'm really hoping that the changes they proposed will actually be instituted. And I'll go ahead and shut up now, give everyone a chance to answer to that or add on to my comment or respond to my comment, but the, I did want to share that. Thank you, Philip. I'm convinced that the uh, regular police officer is trained to always have control. I'm convinced of that. Any interactions that I have with, with the police department, and I have a lot, 
They always want to take control. And the activists, obviously, they want control. So you, you have this dynamic immediately of friction. Can somebody from the police department or the Department of Justice answer this question? Has the training to a normal police officer that we have to deal with on the street, has the training decreased and said to them, you don't always need control? That there are times where somebody just wants direction, just wants to say hello. There are people out there that really like the cops. And sometimes when I see somebody that I know I'd say hi, do they have to have control all the time? Is that a fundamental part of their training? And if it is, how do we change that? How do we change the cop coming up to Joe Walsh and me not fearing him, me not being afraid? You can just think about people who call them, what they go through when a cop comes up to them. So how do we do that? How do we? This is a nice guy. I like this. I don't care what kind of uniform he's got on. When I was in the Navy, I didn't care about the Marines or the Army. They were military. They were guys. They were the guys. Wouldn't it be great if we could have a cop come up and have that same image and not fear him that he's going to ask for my ID, he's going to ask me what I'm doing there, what's going on? How about if he just came up and do what Steve did? Hey, want to go get a cup of coffee? They have those kinds of things where you sit down with a cup of coffee. Tell me about the training. Has it advanced? Or are we stuck in this control factor? So I don't know. Is there, I don't think I see anyone who was. Are you talking about staff control? No, I'm talking about the the training of the police officer, if they're told you must have control of the situation because it's dangerous or whatever, are they told to use some human realities to, to de-escalate the meeting and make it friendly and not this hostile, you know, do what I tell you or I blow your head off? That kind of thing. And I know they're not trained to That's do that. Dennis, could you speak to kind of like what you Mary Claire and Pete are no longer here, so I want to turn to you for the training piece on this, if possible. Well, I uh, like I said earlier, it it's it's beginning to change. So it's been a long time coming, uh, but I think I sort of feel under the new. Uh, Chief of Police, uh, Chief Outlaw, that things are speeding up, that there's a faster process in place uh, to make some of this stuff happen. So it doesn't change overnight. You don't change a police culture overnight. Uh, but I think there's a uh, this I, this kind of training where you don't have to have control over every. Let people talk and rant whatever they need to do. Ask them if they want a sandwich. You know. Uh, there's a lot more of that training now going on around the country. And Portland is about to start some of that. And so I'm, I'm optimistic about that. I'm not going to be too optimistic until we see how it actually plays out. Um, but, um, the, and, and this is, um, and, uh, you know, I've spent hundreds and hundreds of hours riding with police officers in many cities over the last 40 years. And uh, as you know, probably, they face some pretty difficult folks. And they're not liked by a lot of people. And they're constantly having people call them names and spit at them and do things. And so they get to be cynical to some extent. So you have to have forces in place and training to keep that from happening as well. Um, but uh, they need to get out of the car, too. And I know the mayor wants this to happen. And, and, and talk to the rest of the folks in town, like you're saying. And so you can see, gosh, not everybody hates the police. There's some people that actually want to talk to the police. And so, um, but I, I just think that uh, they've been trained uh, for 50 years to go in, get control of the situation, because people are calling and saying, get control of this guy. And their goal is to, and with mental health issues, you know, you can't 
always, when someone's in a crisis state, get them down several notches just by saying, if you don't stop doing that, you know, I'm going to take you in or whatever. You just can't. And so there's a lot of training, though, in Portland. I, I think, and Tom's looked at mental health in other cities. We, we try to give them credit. The, the ECIT program, some of these programs they have with 40 hours, there's a lot going on. I kind of wish that mentality spread throughout the whole bureau and that you, you, you know, where the, they, they have the training to deal with this. And, um, but, you know, I think putting people in the right place in the organization helps. I think that's what the, the mayor and the chief are trying to do so that you have, you want the people down below to look up to these people and say, this is the new set of values or this is what we, we value in this organization. And, uh, and I think so, you know, having the right people on the bus, as they say, is really important to, uh, she needs to get her team in place and hopefully they share her values and, and gradually work on this. Uh, we, we need police chiefs that stay around for a few years. The other thing I see in America is they stay two and a half years. And, uh, and then some, the, the old guard are like uh, batting down the hatch until the storm passes, you know. And uh, so hopefully they'll know that this is here to stay. And, and uh, it's not about DOJ. It's not about the COCOL. It's about what we want to do. And uh, I don't know if that. Thank you. And so I just want to say, yeah, you're next. And then um, it's almost 8. So we're about to wrap up. I want to be sure you had a chance. And then, Nicole, if you have some final words. Steve Entwistle here uh, <clears throat> again. A uh, couple of things that uh, we haven't mentioned is some of the underlying factors involved with, uh, especially with the homeless and people that are uh, going through trauma and crisis. And that is uh, the, repress the repressive uh, economy and the rep repressive laws that we have. Uh, for example, let me give an example. Um, just recently, uh, because of the marijuana legalization that uh, the parks have been, uh, uh, all of a sudden it's illegal to smoke in the park. Okay, now I'm not saying it's legal to smoke marijuana in the park, but I'm just saying any kind of smoking in the park, right? Now, th some people say, well, that's a great idea, that's a good idea. No, it's not a good idea. Because a lot of people <coughs> find refuge in the park, and the police have had a problem trying to get people out of the park. And if you look at some of the uh, San Francisco, uh, what, what happened down there, um, there's some pretty good reports. But anyway, what it does is it makes you illegal to be in the park. And once, you break, once you're illegal and you, break, and you broke a crime or whatever, you've done a crime, then they can come down on you and, and give you a ton of force. And especially, I mean, it's like, for example, so somebody comes in from out of town, he's a tourist, right? Okay. The officer's going to recognize that, you know, as a tourist. He might give him a little break, you know. But it's that same guy, that homeless guy, that keeps going back into the park all the time, okay? And maybe he's had a complaint or two, not because he did anything, but because he, he just looks like somebody that, you know, needs to have supervision or something, okay? But then they shoot him, okay? For example, I can give one example of that was uh, Jack Collins, up in the uh, Arboretum, okay? He was having an episode. He was going through crisis. He was, he was homeless. When I was homeless, I saw him. I was almost sleeping in the same area he was. I almost stepped on him. And uh, I told him, I go, well, you, you can go ahead and stay here. I'll take the bench, you know? He got up in the morning, and he went down the trail, and he just kind of looked at me, you know? And, but he could tell he was, you know, he was off. But he wasn't any threat to anybody. He wasn't dead and consider him dangerous. You know, but he's dead now. He got shot. He's killed by the, by the Portland police. And that's wrong. That, that didn't have to happen. And now you got this new law, and uh, you're going to see a lot more. But like I say, people are in crisis right now. People are going through trauma. Okay? The officers should not take it personally when they're insulted. They should be above that, not below it. Thank you. Thank you. Now, um, Nicole had a couple things, and then our time will be up. I guess I'll just use this to kind of close. You know, I, in the last three comments, appreciate, you know, the identification of truly, like, systemic issues, right? Like, that's what ultimately we are getting at, and it's not just within policing, obviously. It's within housing. Um, it's within education. And within Oregon, the state of Oregon, you know, we're seeing kind of failures on multiple fronts, which 
as a community member is frightening and unacceptable, right? And you're turning to us saying, you know, what is going on? Fix this. This is your job. Um, you know, around equity specifically and around community policing, you know, I'm not a big fan of buzzwords. I think community policing is a buzzword, right? But I very much, um, I've internalized what that means, right? I focus on what that means. It is getting out of your car and saying hello. Right? It is offering to buy someone a cup of coffee, asking what their name is, pausing, taking a breath, having a conversation. I think with Portland, one of the largest issues is that many of our officers don't even live here. And that automatically creates division and it creates the us versus them mentality. Um, and that's something that you know the city has to work to, to remedy over time. I think there's, sadly, honestly, distrust on both sides. Um, I am so heartened by Chief Outlaw's leadership on this. Like She gets it. I've had conversations with her. She's out in the community taking hits and having the tough conversations and calling out the Bureau when she needs to do so. And it's something that I did not see before. With the appointment of Day in particular, you know, he's been leading the equity conversations within the Bureau on top of the work of Al Weatherroy in the Equity and Diversity Office. Having a white man, a white officer, lead those conversations within the Bureau has been instrumental in pulling so many people along and getting them to buy in. And it has to come from leadership. It always does. And we weren't seeing that before. Um, it's a lot to overcome. It takes time. I think the Bureau, as Dennis uh, articulated earlier, is strapped for resources. You know, I've heard really good suggestions tonight. Some of those suggestions require more money. They require more funding. And so I think you know, the onus is on the community, in part, to say, like, okay, what do we want, and how do we want to get there? And if that requires more funding in a specific arena, then OK. But there has to be ownership over that. And I haven't really seen enough conversation between the city, like really nuanced conversation between the city and the community on what public safety is supposed to look like. Lightning, you had a really great suggestion earlier about using ONI to um, harness the power of neighborhoods, right? We can have more conversations about that. That's honestly the first time that I've heard a suggestion like that. Doesn't mean it's the first time it's been made, right? <laughs> um, but I appreciate that kind of feedback. And I think we do, with limited resources, need to be thinking strategically about how we deploy our resources and work with what we have, while also recognizing the reality on the ground with the equity issues, mm -hmm. with training and de-escalation, and also with the rising crime rate, which I've seen, I mean, I've seen a lot of people deny that that's happening. And the stats are there. Just go to PBOT's website, looking at crash, crash fatalities, and also the Bureau's website. And so I think we can have really productive conversations and be honest with each other about where we are as a city and get our Bureau to a place that is acceptable to all of us. And that's in line with Chief Outlaw's vision. Because I know she is excited about the work and is excited by the challenge. But I think we have to help her get there. That's it. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Nicole. I'd like to thank everybody. Oh, go ahead. I just wanted to respond. Mm -hmm. and I uh, I do understand that we have 28 different bureaus, and we believe—I believe—we only have seven equity managers in those bureaus. Am I correct in that? Um, and a specific number you might not know, but obviously there's a disparity in how many equity officers we have and how many we need. So those 28 bureaus—I mean, what if we combine those taxes? The, to a percentage of taxes and provide those for accommodations to make Portland an accessible place. And the other percentage of those taxes can be to hire more equity program managers, specifically for each bureau. So I'm curious your thoughts about okay, that. Okay, so actually, you know, I'm going to go ahead and say the meeting's officially over because we're both <laughs> over time and people are going. I encourage you, Philip, to continue the conversation. Oh, having a conversation. Yeah, great. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Thanks for all the wonderful energy and thinking um, about different ways we can improve the community. 
nice to see you again.